Okay, brilliant. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hamish Moore. He is with Seabec Eco Engineering. So, as Chris already introduced him slightly earlier, is our UK counterpart here. Thanks very much. Um, this uh, talk was sorted out yesterday on the, on the train the way down on a Mac. It's right on a PC and I'm doing it on a Mac, so uh, apologies if there's any sort of slight blips in presentation here. But um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit more, expand on some of the stuff that um, uh, was mentioned before about the use of large wood um, in river restoration projects. Um, and increasingly wood is being used worldwide uh, effectively in river restoration projects and not just river restoration but um, uh, river stabilisation as well. Um, and as advantage over more traditional um, engineering, hard engineering approaches uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it tends to work with the river process. The wood is a natural component of the river system. Uh, it integrates with the bank over time. It becomes a, a sort of living part of the bank as opposed to something discrete uh, like, like rock, rock protection. Uh, it provides direct habitat. The features themselves provide habitat and cover. Uh, and it insists in the development of a uh, diverse physical process and allows for the channel to recover in a natural way if it's an impacted channel. So it allows for channel evolution. Uh, and often environmental uh, uh, regulators like it. If you want to do some work in the river, stabilization of banks or you know, you, uh, maybe grade control, the use of large wood is increasingly you know, approved by the regulators like the EA in Scotland or in, in England rather than SEPA in Scotland. Um, so um, there's, I, 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 you know, the use of wood I'm going to put into three general uh, sort of objectives of why you use it. Although there is a lot of crossover between, and you don't often get, uh, you know, you'll, you'll implement uh, some large wood for one reason, but it often has additional benefits. And, you know, perhaps the most obvious is for sustainable channel stabilisation, for instance, bank, bank protection. Um, but also, and as I mentioned before, direct habitat improvement. You can put these structures in in very simplistic uh, uh, engineered channels to provide some diversity in the channel to provide additional habitat. Uh, and also, a sort of follow-on from that is not just providing the direct habitat, but then kick-starting the evolution of the channel. Uh, the wood is very, very important at driving physical change in channels and providing the diversity, physical diversity that the animals need. Um, so I'm going to give a case study of each of these types, although I may miss out the first one, um, which was the Verbabingley, uh, which is the we've discussed already, and I don't have, have an awful lot of photographs uh, about that. So just to say that in terms of direct habitat improvement, we've done that a lot, and, and, and Emily uh, mentioned that quite extensively, so I won't go into too much uh, detail on that. The other two examples, uh, sustainable bank stabilisation as a restoration project, we did in the, the Scottish borders on the Edelson Water and just recently the Tweed Forum who uh, managed the project won the, the first British River Restoration Prize for their work on well, the whole Tweed system but most specifically Edelson Water and it's an example where we did a realignment, we designed a realignment of a, of a fairly major channel but we had significant constraints, the channel pretty much had to stay in that condition so in order to protect particularly vulnerable areas we lose, use large wood to stabilise the channel. And then another example is assisting channel and habitat evolution is uh, the Alt Lorgi, which is a, a small, um, uh, well, smallish stream in the Cairngorm National Park in, in Scotland. And that's an example where we were able to, with no constraints in the site, the river had been impacted, and we used wood as one of the uh, parts of the design to really reintroduce process and, and allow significant change uh, and improvement of the channel. So through the sequence here, we have increasing river energy. So um, you know, relatively little energy in the habitat improvement, so you know, the, the river's not actually acting on the feature as much, it's just providing habitat directly, uh, right down through the extreme of a you know, fairly high energy system, the Altlorgi, it's got high gradient, a lot of rainfall, a uh, lot of sediment moving, so this is you know, the appropriate type of setting where you can use wood to try and encourage channel change. So um, in terms of large wood uh, stability, um, and it's always a question I always get about using large wood is, will it move? And often in, in settings where you have significant infrastructure downstream, you have to ensure the wood's stable. The wood's not going to move and you know, a large uh, log is not going to you know, end up blocked up against a bridge and damaging a bridge. So there's a number of methodologies to ensure stability or to 
uh, reduce the risk of instability, I should probably say. Um, and using whole trees is a very important one. So you use the, the, the root wad of the tree should be, should be there, and as much of the branches uh, acting as, as sort of anchors uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the, the feature. Um, also, also using large enough trees. Using large enough trees relative to the size of the channel. You shouldn't undersize the trees. You should be sufficiently large trees. Obviously, and maybe a very large system, like a, you know the Severn or something, you're not probably not going to get big enough trees. But then you might apply a different type of uh, wood structure. Um, use sufficient uh, amount of wood. So when you're making a structure, don't necessarily use one piece of wood. Use, use a lattice work of wood, and it's the the structure of the wood. The wood will stabilise the wood. You can build it in such a way, and I'll show a, a, a sort of sketch of an example of how we do that. Um, how the wood structure can uh, provide stability uh, to itself effectively. Um, and you should orientate it appropriately to the flow. If you're using a, a natural piece of wood, depending on the type of um, uh, uh, function it's, it's meant to deliver, for instance, if you're wanting a structure that's going to uh, provide some diversity in the channel, you want the root wad facing upstream, so it acts as an anchor. Uh, so it's, you, know, you, ha you have the feature um, orientated with the direction of flow. And other types of structure are oriented differently, but it's very important to understand how they would naturally be stabilised in a channel. Uh, also partly bury uh, into the bed of the river. So when you put a wood structure in, you don't just plonk it on the top of, the, of a bar surface, you dig a trench for it, put it in and cover it up to some extent. So it's par partially buried in the channel. Uh, and in certain situations, if you're using it in uh, bank protection, like Chris gave an example, not so much of bank filling, but actually forcing the, the log into the bank. But where you don't have that opportunity, you would backfill uh, the material. So you'd put the, the edge of the root wad on the bank uh, and behind that, where the logs are, you would backfill with ballast, maybe rock and, and some uh, soil. Um, and cabling and anchoring. This is a last resort. Usually we found, in even very high energy systems, these types of previous measure, these sort of measures here, are sufficient for stability. And even in very large flows, uh, very large flows, uh, the, the features will remain stable. So it's only under extreme conditions and where there's significant risk downstream, you would consider more engineering approaches to, to stabilization. Um, and, and you'd, you know, in, in terms of determining, uh, you know, the type of measure that you need, we can do calculations based on uh, computational fluid dynamics so to work out what the forces are acting on a piece of wood to work out the type of measure that you would need to, to stabilise it. So, it's the high energy example. It's sort of the worst case scenario in terms of stability of wood, and this is the the uh, uh, Altlargi. Um, as I said, it's in the Cairngorm National Park. This is the channel here. Um, this is the study that we looked at here. And what's happened is that the river has been straightened and canalised. So our job is to try and introduce much more diversity in the channel for, for habitat benefit. Now, if you look at old maps, the river used to look like this. This is 1875 and 1982. So over at least a 100 year period, you had this divided, wandering, uh, braided type of system. So we were trying to return the river to this. So um, it was important to, you know, as part of that, I mean, the, the use of you know, a natural system, wood is very, very important at driving these sort of types of uh, channel plan form. Um, so in its natural, unimpacted settings, you've got a very nice upland gravel bed river, but in the impacted sections you had something not quite so nice. So our job was to try and uh, introduce more diversity into, into the impacted sections. So here um, is an output from a hydraulic model. Um, I've moved away from the convention of blue for water depth. This is brown because often our water is peaty and dark in colour and we use it to make other nice liquids sometimes. Uh, dye is, enjoys the odd whiskey now and again, I believe. <laughs> um, but uh, this is this the site here, and this is the site uh, uh, the, the, the flow is, is from bottom to top here. And we put log structures in these approximate locations here, and this is not exactly what they look like, but just to indicate where they went. And the first job is really to locate the wood, and it is natural wood. So we did locate this, uh, you know, it was, it was um, uh, wood that was uh, adjacent to the channel in, in the floodplain, and, and, and identified specific trees that were appropriate, and got them into the channel, and then started to um, construct them. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. There should be a movie here, but this is what I, I'm not sure that the, I don't use Max. Here we are. So um, 
this is the, the sort of construction process. We're using a whole tree. We've dug a trench in this area here. The root work gets dropped in, and you see this lattice structure building up. We have this feature in this. This is a sort of bend in the river. So there's this feature pointing downstream. This will go over the top. Another one will go over the top. And through that process of burying the 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 the, um, the, uh, the stabilising the, the feature, you'll get uh, you know, a significant stability. Now, how do you get back to the? I'm not a I'm not a Mac person. <laughs> Give it a go. Uh, do you know how to? I think is it that one? Uh, it was that one, yeah. On that one, yeah. <laughs> is it? Mm. Ah, right. Okay, I won't do that again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so we go through this process, and we don't just drop the wood in. Um, we we try and ensure that the wood is doing the job it's meant to do. So we go through a process of hydraulic modelling uh, to do that now. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back and, and, uh, and do this again. Um, so we use a, 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 a 2D model to um, understand the... It didn't work at all. Okay. So anyway, this is, a, this is one of the sites uh, before uh, construction. We moved these large boulder structures, replaced this large wood, Made this lattice structure. Um, I'm not going to show the, the modelling, the modelling out, but the base of the modelling was used iteratively construct this design where we we've got an objective and it's a slightly um, subjective process. But we add bits of wood in. We, we look at the you know the effect that has on the on the hydraulics, and we adjust the you know the, the design until we come up with something that's uh, you know that we're, we're we're happy with. We're also trying to not on this site not only just encourage physical change, we're also trying to if, you know, encourage overbank flow, so we need to try and use the wood to sort of force flow out the channel to have greater connectivity between the, the channel and, and the floodplain. So this is the site, uh, I'll show lots of photographs now about the, about the site, so this is the, the site uh, prior to uh, restoration, so you can see this embankment here, straight channel, very little diversity in the channel, and a little bit of change at the top, so if you look at this top section here, a series of photographs, so this is immediately after the build. So there's some large wood going in here. We've also removed the embankment downstream and we put in some gravel uh, augmentation to a kickstart process. And if you see the distance here between this dead tree and the bank, this is like after a number of, of moderate flow events already. You know, the river's migrated over here. And it hadn't moved in pretty much in 30 years. A number of reasonable sized floods, not big floods. You've got this amount of migration here. Uh, accumulation of sediment in the channel, much more diversity in terms of the physical environment. And then we had a very large flood. Uh, it was the, hurricane Ber the tail end of the Hurricane Bertha event last August. Uh, and we got much more change. So now the tree's gone, the tree's in the channel. Again, much more diverse. We're really moving back towards this braided wandering system. This is only after two years after, and when I say implementation, all we're doing is putting a bit of wood in, Removing and removing constraints, we're doing very little actual construction, and we realise this fairly significant uh, ecological benefit. So this is the site. Obviously, I showed these two photographs before. Then after the big flood event, very significant change uh, in the channel. A lot of um, uh, bank migration, uh, much more diverse in the flow. And you'll notice, although these wood structures have been mechanically damaged through sediment transport, they're in exactly the same place. They haven't moved. These are, these are entirely stable, and there was a big event that did this. And I'll show you in a minute how big the event was. Another site here is before construction, it's, uh, and then this is uh, just after construction. And then here there is a cross channel log structure. We get a reasonable flow. It's a reasonable flow. It's not a big flow event. It's a reasonable sized one. And then we're getting the development of this ripple feature now afterwards. It's Accumulation of sediment uh, upstream of the, the log feature. So far, far greater. This, this is a, a Atlantic salmon spawning stream. This provides a much more uh, habitat for spawning fish here now. Again, our site, this is a, a sort of lateral uh, log feature here, flood event. Log feature is still entirely stable, but we've got this nice gravel bed uh, sort of spawning area feature developing here again. Another example of some riprap that have been put in here, some big boulders. Have been put into for uh, channel stabilisation. We replaced a large um, uh, Caledonian pine there, and um, you know these limbs are sticking out. They're they're deliberately there to try and trap trap further material. 
provide resistance to flow, and then after the large flood event, we get this significant build up of sediment. So, you know, it may be perceived that there might be a fish passage issue here, but fish can easily get past this. There's the flow goes around the sides of it, and plenty of opportunity for fish to get past these because the the log tends to be a you know it's like a uneven structure. There's always uh, uh, opportunity for fish to get past it. So, as I said, large floods. Um, how can they can these uh, structures? <coughs> Sand large floods. This is just downstream of the site. <coughs> this is uh, just a, 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 about a kilometre downstream from the confluence with the next river. This is the next river, the River Dulna, and a famous view from the town of Car Bridge. And this was there was the Hurricane Bertha event. It rained intensely for about 36 hours. And this is the rising limb of the flood. It's the, the flood's still starting to come up now. And this is about two hours later. Um, it was a huge event, it was a hundred year event. And even after this sort of event, these structures are stable. They, 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 they don't move. If they're, if they're built uh, appropriately with the right size material. So, and here you can see the physical change here. This is, um, we surveyed the site um, pre-construction. This, the, the, this is a sub, you know, a one part of the site here. These are the approx um, approximate locations of the wood structures. And then after uh, the large flood, you can see the change there's been a uh, toggle between the two. So it's not only channel migration, it's also a uh, significant greater diversity of the channels, much more diverse than the channel, and this provides excellent uh, habitat opportunity for not just spawning salmon, but invertebrates and juvenile fish and, and other animals. So all these benefits that we realise, I won't go through them in detail, but um, you know, significant physical changes, but what are the implications for habitat? We did some habitat modelling against uh, Atlantic salmon uh, spawning habitat. So basically this predicts how good the habitat opportunity is for, for spawning fish, with one being optimal and zero being no habitat. So you can see a significant increase in these hotspot areas of, of, of these red colors, you know, indicating good spawning habitat. So we appear to have good spawning habitat, post birth as we're calling it. And sure enough, uh, after spawning season, we didn't get a very large number of reds, but we got a significant number of reds. And previously, there had been no spawning here. Very, very, I think there was one observation we got in three years. And then the first year, after, you know, once after the Hurricane Bertha event, significant change. But it doesn't happen overnight. It needs a series of flood events for, to, to realise this, uh, this benefit. Okay, I'll quickly move on to the, I don't have an awful lot of time left, but to go move on to the other uh, type of restoration. This is more about channel stabilisation. This is a project that we did. Uh, with the Tweed Forum uh, on the River Edelston. And here what we've done was a very straight channel uh, for about three kilometres. And this is the previous line of the channel was from upstream and straight down here. So we realigned into this area here to create a more diverse habitat. And what we had to do to ensure the river didn't, in a flood, reoccupy the old channel was protect the banks here and also it rejoined back in here again. So there was an, ups uh, an upstream and a downstream location where we used large wood to protect the banks. So you can probably see it here, there is actually large wood in this location here, but I will um, show you that this, so this is, this is um, it's actually a downstream site here. So this is after it's stabilized for, I think, uh, just one season. So these are these log structures, these root wads facing out, the trunks are going down, uh, going into the bank. And this has really already become part of the bank. And there's, you know, it's after some significant flow events, including the, the Bertha event, which wasn't as big here, but it, you know, the, the river totally withstood the, what the river what was thrown at it. I said, <laughs> this is a, a fairly crude sketch, but this is the type of structure we're talking about in terms of bank protection. It's the river here, the bank here. So we have the log structures with the root wads slightly the lowest level, slightly dug into the bed, uh, and in this sort of herringbone type relationship here, and the blue lines represent the next layer. So we have this sequence of layers, depending on how, how high your bank is, uh, you know, and the structure itself provides stability, and then behind that you backfill. So, in the cross section here, you see what it looks like. This is the river and the bank, and you have this sort of layered structure. And you have many layers depending on uh, on the you know the erosive potential of the river and the height of the bank that's, uh, that you need to protect. So here's an example of it being constructed. This is the trench. You drop the logs into. The cross members go across the top and then backfilled. And we use, uh, in, in, if there's sufficient force in the river to move, potentially move these, we'll drop in large uh, boulder material to, to, to provide some anchoring and then put some backfilling of, and then planting up afterwards. And this is the site obviously being constructed. 
And then I think after two seasons, it's the same, same view here. So if you look at this photograph here, it's the same view. So it's really, you know, it's, it becomes part of the bank. If you use riprap here, you would still be seeing big boulders and, and, and no, no sort of naturalization of the bank. Um, it's another, it's the, the previous one, one I showed. You know, this is uh, after two years in the summertime, this is after in, in low vegetation in the wintertime, and you can see, you know, very much uh, integrated within the, within the bank and, and entirely stable, and also providing great cover and great habitat. But um, an important lesson is when you design these things, don't let them be built without some on site supervision. This is what happened here, it wasn't built to our specifications. And after a large flood event, we got some erosion. Uh, the water got in behind and eroded in between. They didn't put enough layers of it. There was only one layer put in. There wasn't a series of, of structures. So the water got in behind here, started eroding away. We couldn't really totally rebuild. We basically had to drop large boulders in here and extend the feature up. So this is it. This is what happened. And also, they did, I don't know why, but they put, put some just cut logs in here without the root boards intact with this bit jutting out from the bank so in a big flood where you get closer se separation around here all this bank was eroded so we had to go back in you notice all this erosion up here as well upstream of the structures they, they didn't make it big enough and long enough to protect, to protect the bank so like I said we went back in there's the eroding bank so I put some some rip wrap in to fill up the holes uh, in the structure and then we extended the root boards right up through this eroding section and did it backfill, put another layer in, backfilled it, uh, you know, to, to properly, properly protect. Um, we couldn't, <laughs> all we could do to these was just cut the ends off, so they just weren't having uh, such, a, such a great effect. Uh, we, we, we couldn't really change the trees, there was no material left. So uh, this is after, uh, after a little while, well, shortly after, after reconstruction. This is the Baddenley. I'll very quickly show you these examples. Um, we've seen the similar, similar t uh, uh, slides from Emily, but this is uh, looking upstream and downstream, or looking downstream and upstream rather. Uh, very simple channel over widened, and we put, this is immediately after construction, so this isn't anywhere near what the, you know, what the final design is going to be like. But significant wood structures are going in there to provide diversity. Um, but an interesting example is this sluice, uh, and we had to keep this. This is in the upper part of that site. Um, for fish passage, this obviously isn't very good for fish passage, but we had to keep that sluice in place because it was controlling a division of flow between two branches of the river. So it had to stay in place to, to control that. So what we did to use the wood for in this location was to build up, we put this wood structure in here and built up the bed. So we basically drowned out the rear structure. So now there's no uh, fish passage issue and the diversion of flow between this uh, uh, channel and this channel is the same. So. You know, there's many, many applications of using wood, and this is just one of how you can use it to, to benefit fish passage. So that's all I really want to speak about the Baddenley, really. So just in summary, um, use, the use of wood is a, a proven approach for uh, channel stabilization and habitat benefit and mm -hmm. channel evolution. Um, consideration of your objectives, why are you doing it? You know, what's the purpose of, 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 the, of, the, of the job you're doing? Will dictate what you do and where you do it in terms of are you going to try and uh, you encourage channel change or you're trying to stabilise the bank. So different uh, types of approach are, are dependent on what your objectives are. Um, it's important to assess the structure, the performance of the structure through modelling uh, and the stability. So the use of 2D modelling, computational fluid dynamics is very important to one, assess is your structure stable enough, does it need cabling perhaps, uh, and is it working, is it doing the, the job you want, it, you want it to do ecologically. Um, as I said, appropriate anchoring. Um, this ties back into this issue here. You know, very, you know, in very limited uh, situations where you've got high energy and significant risk, you you would use uh, cabling and other uh, types of engineering measure to stabilise. But otherwise, it's, I would encourage you know not to use those structures. I think as Chris had mentioned before, um, and again, on-site design guidance. It's very important to be on there. It's not an exact. It's not like a wall you're building you're trying to find the right bit of wood and fit it and there's very much an expert judgment sort of field fitting type of element to this. It has to be done in a sort of uh, iterative sort of way depending on the bits of wood you have. And monitoring. Um, the the, the Altlorgi example I gave, all the post-project red counts, all the post-project surveys 
and modelling. We funded that ourselves because we, you know, we realised it was such an important project to try and monitor, to get information about how these channels evolve when you do this type of work. But you know, we need. I think there just needs to be more opportunity to incorporate the monitoring. I know it always is incorporated in principle, but in practice, it often doesn't really get done. I think there needs to be much more monitoring in these types of uh, application, which is a fairly new science. We need to understand if it works or not. And I think I've been over my time, but that's that's me.